Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. I wish to report on the use of the kinesiograph for clinical research and to describe how it's been used for this purpose in the Department of Occlusion for studying jaw movement. The manual that accompanies the instrument describes its use in conjunction with the Maya monitor for both diagnosis and treatment of functional disturbances of the masticatory system. I do not believe that the clinical instruction given in the manual for this purpose is valid. On the other hand, the instrument itself is very useful for monitoring jaw movement in three planes, and that's what we shall describe right now. The advent of sophisticated electronic circuitry has allowed the use of intraoral magnets and their small signals to be detected and monitored. For this purpose, the kinesiograph employs a small magnet which is attached to the lower incisor teeth and its field is detected by an array of sensors on a head frame supported out of the mouth. The advantage of the kinesiograph over other jaw tracking devices is that it is simple to use, it is non-invasive in that one isn't interfering with tooth form or the occlusal surface, it doesn't require any clutches or rods to be protruding out of the mouth, the intraoral magnet weighs less than two grams so weight is not a problem and the head frame is simple to apply. The kinesiograph itself is composed of a storage oscilloscope, an array of amplifiers for monitoring different axes and a set of controls which allows for selection of whichever plane of reference one wants to record from so that one can record the sagittal, the frontal or the horizontal plane of reference depending upon which one displays the movement sequence best. If one wished to record the sagittal plane, namely as indicated by this button, that would be recording in effect the vertical and anteroposterior axes to give an XY trace of the sagittal plane. If one wanted to record the frontal plane, then by depressing the frontal selector button one automatically records both the vertical and the lateral axes giving an XY trace of the frontal plane. And thirdly, the horizontal plane selects the anteroposterior and the lateral axes for displaying an XY trace of the horizontal plane. As well, this dual beam selector allows both the sagittal and the frontal plane to be recorded at the same time if this is required. The head frame consists 
of a lightweight aluminium tubing frame to which are attached an array of magnetic sensors. The sensor at the bottom of the frame detects vertical movement in relation to the intraoral magnet. There are two magnetic sensors laterally. The most posterior ones on each side detect lateral movement, whilst the forward one detects anteroposterior movement of the intraoral magnet. As well, the sixth sensor, situated at the top of the head frame, is designed to detect Earth's magnetic and other externally generated fields and to cancel out their effects because clearly they would also be detected by the lower sensor array which is monitoring jaw movement. The sensors are arranged spatially in a critical orientation such that if a line is projected from the center of the intraoral magnet to the center of lines projected from the vertical, the lateral, and as well the midpoint of the anteroposterior magnets, these lines will intersect in three perpendicular axes when the teeth are in maximum intercuspation so that maximum intercuspation is the zero point from which spatial changes of the intraoral magnet are monitored by the lower sensor array. The sensor is, the sensor frame is simply attached with this head frame lightweight head frame and attached to this horizontal bar. I think we should describe the situation that exists clinically for the use of the kinesiograph. I wish to now set the kinesiograph for clinical use. Our first task is to Look at the occlusion of the patient and attach the magnet. Close together. Maximum occlusion indicates a satisfactory incisal relationship to allow magnetic attachment to the lower incisors without interfering with the upper teeth. The magnet is attached with cement or may also be attached with cold curing acrylic resin. We found that uh, Duralon cement works very well. The important thing with magnetic attachment is the magnet orientation. It's essential that the magnetic north be directed to the patient's left. Close the teeth into occlusion. And that the axis of the magnet be parallel to the occlusal plane. Setting time is one to two minutes. The magnet is now firmly attached to the lower incisor teeth, just close together. It is not in contact with the upper teeth in maximum intercuspation. Its transverse axis is parallel to the occlusal plane and magnetic north is directed towards the patient's left.
Now we'll attach the head frame and the sensor array. The simple head frame fits across the bridge of the nose, just sit forward, and is attached over the ears with an elasticized strap. Like so. The head frame may now be positioned on this horizontal bar. The orientation of the sensor array is critical and must now be zeroed using the kinesiograph. With the teeth in maximum intercuspation, the head frame is moved in three planes until the dot on the screen is in the same position for the three axes. We adjust first the rotational adjustment on button one and look at the disposition of the three axes. We can improve that fractionally. The oscilloscope screen displays the dot along the vertical axis and in both the sagittal, the frontal and the horizontal plane there should be no more than one millimeter difference at the zero point. Button two varies the sensor array anteroposteriorly and button three varies it up and down such that if I move the display, the sensor array up, the dot moves down. The dot on the screen is almost right at the center of the intersection of the two axes in the sagittal plane. With the teeth in maximum occlusion all the time, if we move now to the frontal plane, there's a movement to the right and a slight movement upwards in the horizontal plane. That needs a little more refinement. And once the three axes don't move the dot any more than one square millimeter, we've then zeroed the equipment and we're ready to now record jaw movements. The position of the dot on the screen is below the center of the axes because that's postural position, not maximum occlusion. When the teeth are in maximum occlusion, 
the dot is centered on the screen. And in this case, in the sagittal plane, and as well the frontal and the horizontal planes. If we wish to display both the sagittal and the frontal planes together, then we can press that button as well as the sagittal so that we can achieve a double tracing. So that the tracing on the left will be tracings in the sagittal plane and that on the right will indicate tracings in the frontal plane. If we wish to then include the horizontal plane, we would have to exclude one of the others. We're only able to display uh, two planes of reference simultaneously. If our patient was now to open and close, you can see the movement of the trace. If we store that, if we store that signal, we can see it in more detail. Opening, closing signal on the left in the sagittal plane and on the right in the frontal plane. Open, close again. Great deal of precision with zero point maximum intercuspation. Now, if you were to protrude the jaw and retrude the jaw and back to centric occlusion, the protrude retrude is displayed in the sagittal plane, but there's almost no display in the frontal plane because there's very little lateral movement in this case. If, on the other hand, the jaw was to be moved to the right and to the left, move to the right, now to the left, that is, and back to centric occlusion, The right-left movement is clearly displayed in the frontal plane and very little right-left movement can be seen in the sagittal plane. So depending upon which plane of reference best reveals the movement sequence, we would select that plane of reference. The jaw movements displayed were consciously controlled movements. Now we wish to show reflexly controlled jaw movements, namely functional chewing. And for this purpose, apple cubes, 15 millimeter cube, just place that in the mouth ready, are prepared uh, for mastication. The screen will now be cleared of the conscious movements and we're ready now for chewing. Chew now, please. What is being displayed is the functional envelope of jaw movement on the left of the screen in the sagittal plane and on the right in the frontal plane. We're particularly interested in studying functional movements in which there's a predominant reflex control and as well to compare these also with consciously controlled movements. As far as the envelopes of function are concerned, we're looking at the areas of the functional envelopes and comparing these in our assessment of motor control of jaw muscles. In studies on motor control of jaw muscles, we've been particularly interested in what contributions are made by peripheral receptors, and most especially what contribution is made by those receptors located in the temporomandibular joint capsule. If one anesthetizes the majority of the nerve endings in the temporomandibular joint capsule and then looks at the envelope of function, changes occur. Changes in the shape and the size of the envelope of function indicating that peripheral receptors do have some control in ongoing jaw movement. What I wish to show now is the technique for providing regional nerve block to the majority of temporomandibular joint capsule receptors, namely those located in the posterior and lateral areas of the capsule, 
the blockade of which is achieved by an auriculotemporal nerve block and periarticular infiltration. It's been well established that it is the posterior and lateral areas that are most densely innervated and one does not need to worry about the other regions of capsule to uh, achieve blockade of the majority of the afferent information emanating from the articular capsule. Anatomical landmarks used for uh, the injection technique are those based on uh, standard prosthetic landmarks. One uh, measures a distance along the tragal lateral canthal line from the posterior part of the tragus, 12 millimeters anterior. and then five millimeters immediately below in the vertical plane. So that the second point indicates the point of placement of the needle for auriculotemporal nerve block. The area is um, palpated to confirm that situation. Just open, close, open, close, open, close. It's possible to palpate and identify the posterior, posterior lateral corner of the condyle. Open, close. So the penetration point is posteroinferior to the condyle. The area is swabbed with an antiseptic and the point of entry re-established. And now one prepares for a sterile injection of that region. The anesthesia technique involves the use initially of a vapor coolant spray applied to the superficial areas uh, to allow um, needle penetration with, without any discomfort. The external auditory meatus and as well the, um, the eye, the ipsilateral side, are protected and the spray and the spray applied to the surface initially the injection needle is directed uh, posterior inferiorly about five degrees to depth of 12 to 15 millimeters. An injection of about one millimeter during withdrawal. At the point of um, Finalizing the posterior injection, one moves the needle tip and directs it then uh, laterally and anteriorly to 
to provide uh, a small amount as well uh, of lateral anesthesia. Half a millimeter. It will take uh, a little time for the anesthetic effects to be, uh, to be clear cut, to be obvious. And we shall wait now until posterior natural anesthesia has been achieved. We'll test the spread of the anesthetic anteriorly. And then we'll examine the envelope of function following unilateral joint anesthesia. Following anesthesia, one assesses subjectively the area superficially over which the anesthesia is, has been achieved. Can you feel that? 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 A little. That? A little. That? A little bit. Not up there. No. So. The disposition of the anesthesia is satisfactory in that we have not involved any motor nerves to uh, uh, motor branches of the facial nerve. We have, in fact, achieved superficial anesthesia overlying the joint. It has not spread beyond the anterior aspect of the joint, and as well, it has affected some of the auricular temporal uh, region. We are now ready to record your mo movement sequences again after unilateral anesthesia. So that initially we look at consciously controlled jaw movements as before and then look at reflexly controlled jaw movements in function with chewing. Just move the jaw open and close. Open, close. Open, Close. What we're looking for now are changes in the area contained within the movement sequence. And with unilateral anesthesia, they're not great. And one will have to assess that more carefully to quantify the effects. If you protrude and retrude, centric occlusion, you can see that now there was, in fact, a component um, a lateral component of protrusion recorded in the frontal plane. If one moves right and left, back to centric occlusion, we'll have to examine those movement sequences to see what changes, what changes exist between um, pre and post anesthesia. If now we erase that record and look at reflexly controlled movements, namely in function. Would you just place that apple segment in your mouth? Now chew, please. One can see that there's still a great deal of precision with jaw movement, even after unilateral joint anesthesia. But there are some changes that are apparent in the shape of the envelope of function, at least in the initial movements. The initial movements appear to be more broad and more extensive after anesthesia, certainly after bilateral anesthesia. Anesthesia should now be achieved for the left temporomandibular joint to provide bilateral regional nerve block of the articular capsules, which best shows the effect of motor loss uh, on the envelope of function. We should go to an XY recorder now 
to see the functional envelopes best displayed in that way. Kinesiograph signals of jaw motion are stored on magnetic tape for later display either on a polygraph or an XY recorder. The signal is displayed via the tape recorder on the polygraph as shown on the screen. And they have the advantage in allowing the muscle response, the individual electromyographic response, to be displayed in conjunction with jaw movement in three planes. The top trace is the vertical plane, anteroposterior plane, and the lateral plane. And the muscle display below is the contralateral side. So that one can examine the effects of individual muscle response on jaw movement. However, the interpretation of these tracings is rather difficult, at least from a purely visual point. And for that reason, the visual display on the XY recorder gives a much more readily discernible variation and we're going to look at the XY recording traces now. The XY recorder traces out a two-dimensional picture along two axes for either sagittal, frontal, or horizontal planes, depending upon which plane of reference one wants to record. I would now like to show some envelopes of function of some chewing sequences recorded where the information has been stored on tape in this way. We'll now show some envelopes of function before anesthesia. The tracings to be displayed show tooth contact at the lower part of the trace and the opening movement occurs in the upward direction. That was a chewing sequence in the sagittal plane recorded with a magnification of about six times at the speed of chewing. Now we'll look at the same movement sequence in the frontal plane. Note the fluency of movement into and out of maximum intercuspation. I'd like to display some envelopes of function following unilateral anesthesia, in this case of the right temporomandibular joint capsule. Note the fluency of movement and the precision at and about intercuspal position. The frontal tracings illustrate the same fluency and the terminal functional angle is slightly different in this case being recorded in the frontal plane. Now we look at envelopes of function following bilateral anesthesia firstly in the sagittal plane. The shape of the functional envelope has changed considerably and we'll look at that comparison a little bit later. Movements in the frontal plane can once again be seen to be very precise, but the overall area of the envelope of function, as in the sagittal plane, has changed. The next series of recordings is from another subject, once again initially in the sagittal plane, these tracings recorded before anesthesia. This is now a recording made in the frontal plane of subject number two. Note the different terminal functional angle.
quite a different shape of cyclical jaw movement. Now we'll look at the envelope of functional after unilateral anesthesia. In the sagittal plane, once again, there's a change in the shape of the envelope of function now. Now on the frontal plane, note the fluency of movement once again at tooth contact. and a high degree of precision even after unilateral anesthesia. Now we'll look at envelopes of function following bilateral anesthesia. Compare the difference in the form. Speed is actual speed of jaw motion. Now in the sagittal plane. Now we're looking at chewing in the frontal plane again. Note the precision of the terminal functional angle, even though there's an enormous variation in the overall shape and size in comparison to pre-anesthetic levels. The tracings that have just been recorded are now displayed in a montage. The upper series represent tracings from one subject, and the lower series tracings from another subject. The first tracings were made without anesthesia, the middle set with anesthesia of the right temporomandibular joint capsule, and the third series made after bilateral anesthesia of the temporomandibular joint capsule. Note the progression of change. When we look at the initial trace from the first subject, the envelope of function is quite compact, the terminal functional angle is quite broad, and the overall envelope shows some variation of individual cycles, but is relatively compact. This is even more so in the sagittal plane. I should add that the tracings have now been reversed, so they now appear as they would uh, in the mouth. The second series for that subject shows in the sagittal plane a distinct increase in area over which the jaw movement occurs, and even more so in the frontal plane is this the case. But note that the terminal functional angle or the approach into and out of intercuspal position is constant. Finally, with this subject after bilateral anesthesia, the envelope of function in the sagittal plane is much more variable, extends over a much broader area with a greater sp spatial spread of individual jaw movements. This is even more noticeable in the frontal plane where there is a much broader uh, and larger envelope of function so that there's an increase in size both laterally and vertically following joint anesthesia, and this is a progressive thing. The same is true of the second series, although the envelope of function in its overall form is quite different from that of the first series. Note in particular the shape of the terminal functional angle is different, both in the frontal and in the sagittal planes indicating that the occlusal constraints are different for subject number two than they were for subject number one. If we compare the size of the envelope of function once again, there is a progressive increase from no anesthesia as we move across to anesthesia of one side, the overall size is increased, and this is so in both planes. It is most noticeable, of course, following bilateral anesthesia where the area over which jaw movement occurs is very much broader in both the sagittal and the frontal plane. But once again, the terminal functional angle is constant. At least it's constant in each plane so that in the frontal plane or in the sagittal plane, it's the same for all three recordings. 
it is quite clear from these tracings that the mechanoreceptors in the temporomandibular joint capsule play a role in the control of jaw movement in that if their afferent discharges are blocked by anesthesia then the envelope of function is less precise and more varied. It is quite clear that functional jaw movements still occur with a high degree of precision and the muscle receptors must be the ones involved. The implications that the uh, temporomandibular joint mechanoreceptors have uh, insofar as patients with TM joint muscle pain problems are concerned is currently being investigated in the Department of Occlusion. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.